Welcome to Making Waves. Welcome to Making Waves. Fresh ideas and freshwater science. Fresh ideas and freshwater science, and, and why, why they, they matter, matter to, you. to you. Making Waves. Making Waves is brought to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support from, from the Society, Society for, for Freshwater, freshwater science. science. I'm your podcast co-host, Dr. Aaron Larson. For this episode, Dr. Eric Moody and I teamed up to interview Dr. Aaron Eggleston, who is a professor at Middlebury College, and Dr. Becca Barnes, who is a professor at Colorado College. Both Aaron and Becca think deeply about mentoring and take action to improve mentoring in scientific fields. They will be sharing some of their thoughts and advice with us today. To start with, Aaron talks about office hours as a potential mentoring space. Time to interact with students, and it's time that's set aside, but often feels off-putting for students to come at that period of time, and so there's a, a little bit of a barrier initially to getting students feeling comfortable coming to office hours, so mm-hmm. that's a, that's an interesting barrier in trying to sort of normalize that that time is set up for students and uh, is meant to help them with class material or study habits or, you know, advising questions. All of those things are territory that can be covered in office hours. Um, And so I, you know, I've outlined office hours every week and then by appointment meetings as well. And so some of that is creating a culture around what office hours can be. And so I try to emphasize that starting out in classes and then, you know, throughout a term making, making it um, an open space for students to come in and ask a wide range of classes. And I find that often what will bring a student into office hours is a question about content in a class. And then it's a great time. If they're there, I can touch base about, you know, how other things are going, what's coming up, what's their next set of classes looking like for registration, or they're thinking about studying abroad or research, or, you know, it sort of opens up opportunities for other conversations to happen. But there is sort of a, uh, an activation energy, a barrier to getting people to come and use that time or feel comfortable coming and meeting. Um, yeah, so like related to that, one thing that I think it was you that I learned about is just the simple idea of having a doodle poll where you can have students like fill out the poll and make sure that they actually can yeah. make it to your yeah, office hours. Yeah, for sure. So if I you know set up office hours at times that work best for me, that's great for my schedule, but it means that in the past when I've just implemented office hours at a specific time, uh, students don't often have the same time, and so I end up making, eight, you know, six other appointments a week for when office hours can happen, so I try to doodle poll or somehow get a sense of um, time availability of students who are enrolled in the class and try to match as best as possible. Of course, in uh, the intro class I have right now, 40 students, there's never going to be a perfect three hours a week that work for office hours, but I can try to optimize for timing that is fits into different schedules and then you know, still utilize the by appointment times as needed. Office hours are one strategy for providing mentorship to students. Next, Becca describes mentor mapping, a strategy she uses and teaches in workshops to help students and others identify gaps in their current mentorships. Well, I think that in terms of one-on-one mentoring, it's really just about sort of recognizing that the people who are seeking it from you um, just just want the same thing that your friends want from you in terms of respect and, you know, advice and being honest. And I would say that in terms of sort of more formal mentoring strategies, um, we have, we being folks that I've worked with to develop the undergraduate mentoring program that I'm part of and uh, the Earth Science Women's Network, we've developed what we call mentor mapping, which is a really great way to think about our mentoring in a very deliberate and sort of it takes a village way. And the re- I've done this with undergrads. Um, I teach in an isotope class in the summer, so I'm doing it there with postdocs and faculty members, right? So I think that it doesn't it doesn't really matter how old you are or where you are in the sort of scientific evolution, <laughs> um, uh, but it's it can be really helpful because it just acknowledges that we all need uh, various types of support, and that support is not just intellectual support, right? And if we're being honest, we often seek emotional support from people in our workplaces, and that can be okay, but it's also not something that everyone is comfortable giving, 
And I think that if we can, and that those being sort of intellectual and emotional being, often things that uh, can be uh, really different, but you can also get it from one person. And so I think that um, the mentor map essentially gives us all of these different categories of mentoring that we all need. So uh, who is someone who advocates for you? Who is someone who you can uh, make sure they hold you accountable for what really matters? So for a lot of my friends, that's their kids. Right? We don't often think of our kids as mentors, right? but if someone's holding you accountable right, by making sure that you don't work all the time, that is mentorship. right? And so really expanding the idea of what mentorship is. It's not just your PhD advisor giving you like red comments on <laughs> your latest draft or being like, seriously, like why weren't you in lab until 10 p.m. last night or whatever ridiculous thing they've said to you. Um, it's really about thinking about how to support the whole person. And so what I like about it is that one, generally people come away from this activity feeling more supported than they did coming in because they recognize that they actually have a lot of support. It also gives us a way to move forward and think about, okay, what do I need? So a lot of times people need an advocate or don't know if they have one, but you can't just go up to someone and be like, will you be my advocate, right? That doesn't work. So we generally, we brainstorm strategies for finding these people. And usually that knowledge is within the room. Like I'm not the one who's providing it, which also then sort of reinforces the idea that you can gain mentorship from your peers. What we do um, is uh, I generally start with actually this picture and it's, um, I have no idea where my friend got it, but it's these two kids and one of them is pushing the other one out what looks like a cat door or a dog door to a house. And so it is, it's a hilarious picture and the, I have a question under it, um, is this support? Right. And so I like it's a funny picture. So people usually laugh. And then we talk about, well, what is support? Right. So depending on your perspective, that is an older or younger sibling who's like, get out of the house. I don't want you. <laughs> or the little ones like, I really want to go outside. And the bigger sibling is helping them get outside. Right. So pointing out that support looks different based on your perspective and it really takes us away from that sort of ladder uh, analogy that we often use in academia in terms of looking up for advice and support as opposed to looking to the sides. So I think, you know, Sheryl Sandberg in her Lean In book, which I have some issues with, but um, in general, there's lots of really great things in there. And I think one of the best parts about it is she talks about this as a jungle gym. Right. And she doesn't she talks about, you know, moving through your career, not just in a vertical way. And I think that that's really important because it also points to the fact that there's all these people to the sides of you that can also help. And I always think about my students as also being my mentors. Right. They remind me of what I'm good at, which a lot of us as hypercritical humans need to be reminded that we're good at things. And they also hold me accountable. STEM creates some unique challenges for mentoring relationships. Erin describes some of those challenges, especially the way that STEM courses progress compared to other majors. I think one of the challenges in navigating some of the STEM majors here, and I don't, I would imagine it's similar in other college environments, is that STEM courses and STEM majors are very hierarchical. Like there's a very sort of specific trajectory that you have to um, migrate through and they build. So, you know, there are prerequisites for upper level courses. Um, and if you haven't taken three classes, you might not be able to take the fourth. Um, and so just getting students to, um, or working with students to have them be familiar with prerequisites and sort of the uh, ways in which they want to walk through classes in the curriculum is different than some of the other um, majors, especially on campus, that are, have a more sort of lateral structure, where once you've probably taken one or a few of the intro classes, there's a whole range of options that open up and there's less structure for how those majors progress. So I think that's, um, that's a difference for STEM, most of the STEM majors, where the upper level curriculum has more to do with classes you've taken before. Now, Becca discusses how asking for help can be challenging for STEM students and how mentors can help students with that discomfort. 
I think that the biggest challenge for my students is asking for help. Yeah. And seeing that as a weakness as opposed to a strength. And um, in my classes, I definitely get on a little soapbox on the first day about the importance of being wrong and embracing how we're all wrong and for scientists and, you know, all of these things. But especially students who, once they move into that sort of research space and there's the lack of right answer or defined outcomes, you or at least I have observed that um, even the most confident student, when there was a problem set to do, they were like, oh, I do not know how to do number three, right? And they could ask for help then. But it's like realizing that you can ask for help even if you're not quite sure what you need help with. For some folks, being a graduate student might be the first opportunity they have to be a mentor. Erin describes ways that graduate students can approach mentoring. I worked with handful of undergraduates when I was a grad student um, in the research lab, and that was very different from my interactions with them as a teaching assistant for courses when I was um, in grad school. And so I think there's sort of like two, those are sort of two different pictures, but they're related in my mind. So giving students in a lab um, the opportunity to learn new techniques, new skills, um, sort of build their lab toolkit uh, is helpful. And yeah, you're hoping that they're going to help progress your project or contribute meaningfully to your project, but having some flexibility in um, what they can be working on, um, I think made the experiences more meaningful. For, so for students that I hired to specifically just do a task, count cells under a microscope, um, I think they got something out of that experience, but not as much as the ones who had a little more flexibility in the types of techniques they were using or, you know, developing some of the questions. Um, and so that, as I sort of progressed through grad school, I was able to be a better research mentor in figuring out how to help people have these authentic research experiences. Being a graduate student is one position where we're exposed to new responsibilities as a mentor. Now, Becca discusses more strategies for approaching mentoring as a new faculty member or in another new position or career stage. You're probably already a mentor. So it's not some like secret sauce um, or secret formula that makes you a good mentor because you probably are already providing mentorship um, to someone in your life, right? Mentorship doesn't have to be this like huge action right, or a huge act, right, and so if you want to be very deliberate about your mentoring, right, like, but I, I would say, like, set small goals, like, um, and they should be goals that are trying to get to know your mentor in as a whole person, right, because you're probably already linked up for a reason that is pretty identifiable if you're a new faculty member, right, um, but if you are not someone who is comfortable, like, getting to know your students in that way, then don't do it. Like, that's actually totally fine, right? Like, I don't expect, you know, everyone to have the same relationship with their students as I do, right? And you need to just uh, sort of understand your own boundaries, right? But, like, just because someone doesn't share your intellectual interest or someone doesn't share your background doesn't mean that you can't be a resource for them. And I think that that's the key is, right, so students – I don't know, I get assigned first year advisees, right? Um, and so they probably have said somewhere on their application that they're interested in environmental science, but you know, they've never met me, they didn't choose me, they haven't had a class with me. And I try to just listen to what they're saying and like reflect it back. And I just, right, I was just acting as, I think of it as like a card catalog to resources at Colorado College, right? Like oh, you're interested in physics? Well, you know, I'm not in the physics department, but I have a friend who's in the physics department, and I can send that email, right? And I show them that it's really accessible, and so then hopefully they can be like, oh, I can just email that professor too and get that information for me myself, right? Um, and so it can be these really small acts, right? Just calling the registrar's office for a student can solve so many problems. Right? And, like, does it matter that the student is, like, why the student hasn't gone to the registrar's office? Not really. Right. Yeah. Right? Like, because you can call them, and the reality is you have more power. Yeah. 
get the answer faster. You may get the same exact answer as them, but the student is going to trust it coming from you more than the person that they don't know at the registrar's office. And that is providing them greater comfort and greater access to the system that they have just entered, right? And so I just think it's important to show those small acts of kindness, right? Like it's so easy to just be like, oh, here's the registrar's number, do it yourself, right? Or go to the registrar's across the, across the quad. But, like, if I call them, right, the student then knows, one, I care enough to make a phone call, right, and that the information is actually very readily available. Your syllabus in your classroom can be a place where you can mentor students. Erin describes how she uses her syllabus to be approachable and strategies for encouraging students to come to office hours. To the extent possible for classes, I outline in my syllabus, um, you know, sort of my expectations for group dynamics and inclusivity in classroom and try to make it clear that, you know, everyone has space, we're holding space for everyone uh, in class and that that is also true outside of class. Um, and so in that way, trying to be approachable, but just because it's written doesn't mean everybody reads it or feels like that, it, you know, it could just be written on paper. Um, and so I think by uh, reaching, you know, sort of reaching out to students, whether it's um, at a point where there's been a quiz or an exam or just somebody's missed class, right? And I don't know why. Did they sleep in? Maybe. But maybe there's something else deeper than that. And just sending check-in emails to say, you know, noticed you weren't here, hoping you're okay. And that's been enough to trigger some folks coming in and chat chatting in office hours about external things from class that are making it hard for them to be present. Um, and then I also think uh, not everybody feels comfortable coming to office hours, and I'm okay with that because uh, I have peer tutors, sort of like a TA, undergrad TA style, um, and so I encourage them if they don't feel comfortable coming to me to reach out to peer tutors for the class and make other resources through the Center for Teaching, um, Learning, and Research. There's a number of different sort of peer tutor options. So if I'm not the sounding board as a mentor yet, um, that there are other resources available that they can perhaps feel more comfortable interacting with peers who've been in the course before, who have other expertise that might support them. Uh -huh. um, so my goal is that I'm not too scary or I'm not too off-putting, but I know that that is a there is a huge power dynamic there. And so sometimes it's easier, at least initially, to open up to a peer and then if the peers are also encouraging students to come meet with me, um, then I, I see more people come through and chat. One of the trickiest parts of being a scientist is figuring out how to ask for help. Becca tells us how she encourages students to ask for the help they need. Right, so I think that the lack of, it's like they don't know what to Google. Sort of, you know, and um, not that I'm Google, but they um, don't know, right? They're they're so paralyzed without by not knowing the next step that they don't even know how to ask for help, not knowing that next step. And that's whether that's graduate applications, whether that's applying for REUs, whether that's doing um, research, right? All of these things, right? It's similar and especially my students are, you know, they have been very high achieving humans for most of their lives and um, are sometimes a little bit paralyzed by the fact that they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like the first time that's happened for them. And I mean, it's, got, it's, a, it's a nice privilege for that to be the first time it's happened to them. But it also like just reminds you that you need to essentially like just ask for help. It's okay. And I just try to say that to them. So I say, I, I often say things like, let me know how to, I can be a resource for you. And I say it in that sort of it's almost clinical, right, very sterile way. But it's mostly because I want them to understand that that's my job, right? It's, um, it's not about whether they're my friend or what have you, right? Because students, of course, see my research students and they see the relationships I have with them. And they're like, well, I don't have that relationship with Becca, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to help them, of course, right? And so trying to figure out how to break down that, that barrier, because for other students, there's no barrier, right? They have no boundary problems, right? They ask for help all the time. And so even the perception, right, between student groups can be really different. So I think that that's hard.
Sometimes mentors and mentees have very different interests. Erin outlines how she helps students who have career goals that are very different from her expertise. Yeah, so I don't pretend that I can be an expert in anybody who's interested in industry or NGO or, you know, these different careers that I have not entertained. Um, you know, I think they're – so I am upfront as much as possible with mentees about that lack of knowledge in my path. And to the best of my ability, you know, it's like depending on the student and their interests – I can think about folks I know who have gone through and, you know, they transition from a master's into a different type of program or just right out of undergrad, they had a different path. Um, and so if I can, if I can make those connections, um, I'm happy to do that for students or point them towards those folks. Um, and then I also just rely heavily at Middlebury on the Center for Careers and Internships, um, but other sort of resources around campus whose explicit job is to match students with sometimes academic, but also outside of academic track types of internships um, and rely on the sort of alumni network that is ever expanding um, that can match students with you know, broad interests across the board. And then I also just, uh, you know, if I come up with examples of I worked for a civil engineer after undergrad for two years and I had no engineering training. So just encouraging students to reach out to people they're interested in interacting with um, to, to make contacts in those spheres. And that can be off-putting. It's challenging to reach out to something that feels totally unfamiliar. Um, but if they feel comfortable reaching out that that... Um, that's a great mechanism too, but also to not feel gutted if they don't hear back from an email to some sort of shot in the dark person. And that, you know, that's, that's when I really encourage them to reach out to other resources that are, whose job it is to help pair them with those types of um, expertise in different areas outside of academic tracks. In addition to admitting when we need to send students to other people to get the mentorship they need, Becca shares how we can model vulnerability to show students that it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah, and I think it's also for me, right, like doing math in front of students, it doesn't matter if it's addition, like I'm going to do it wrong more often than I'm going to do it right. Like I am fair, like I think I am a capable math, math person, right, but like put it on a board with like a piece of chalk, like I will make a mistake, right, and I think that it also like really relieves that pressure of being perfect in front of students, right? Like, we don't know things all the time, and we know that, but they don't know it. And I think that if you can just, if you can, uh, I don't know, it's not like let your guard down. Oh, like your ego, like let your ego be a little bit less, right? Mm -hmm. And we can just admit our flaws and be real people as opposed to whatever person you're trying to play as you're professing. Similarly, as a mentor, we have to acknowledge our limitations. Erin discusses how she encourages students to take advantage of other resources. So, as a mentor, I think my job is to know, part of my job at least, is to know where my limitations are and then have done enough reading and chatted with enough folks. And I'm still finding resources that exist, but to be able to point people to the proper resource um, or the resource that has more expertise where I don't have it. Yeah, like every campus has a lot of resources for their students, so yeah, yeah. just knowing what those are and being able to find students in the right, right. place. Is yeah, so I think part of it, I mean, it's definitely on my shoulders to know what the resources are that are available and to keep up with, because they change somewhat regularly, um, you know, who the contact people are for that. Uh, and then, you know, also I feel like to a certain extent, the students are responsible for knowing where to look a little bit, and so... You know, for advisees, I tend to meet them or try to meet them about halfway where mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, you do a little bit of legwork on this, and then I'll figure out who the CCI or the Center for Careers and Internship um, person is that would be the best point person, and then we'll go on from there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think part of it is, too, like encouraging students to uh, feel comfortable navigating how to find resources and how to find support because in the absence of an academic setting especially, there aren't always people there to point you in the right direction. So letting students not flounder, but sit a little bit in the, the gray area and, and figure out where the best point person might be. Um, I think that is also 
um, a skill set that's good to work on. Becca has done a lot of work on creating and sharing mentoring resources and expanding mentoring networks. She shared some information on those programs with us. Yeah, so um, our undergraduate mentoring program that was funded through an IUS grant, so that's Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, um, we are in our like last no-cost extension year, and so we're submitting uh, a proposal in December to really look at the scalability and sustainability of it nationally, um, or the hope is to make it national because we've had really um, great results, and I will... Without a doubt, I mean, the reason I'm as embedded in the mentoring literature and all of these things is because I work with these amazing educational psychologists and uh, folks from, like, STEM evaluation teams that have given me so many resources and ways of thinking about this in a more formal way um, so that I can go to, like, ed sessions and, you know, like, pick up all these things that... You know, we commonly do at conferences around our science, but we often don't go to the educational or outreach sessions and think in the same way about being like, oh, I could try that. And, like, you can try it in a small way. It doesn't mean you need to start a national mentoring program, right, you know? And I think it's made it easier for me to take those little tidbits and make them um, – incorporate them into my into my life and my work um but i'm super excited about this submission and um i mean hope obviously we hope it gets funded um but we're specifically thinking about how well we can develop a model that allows us to test sort of a train the trainer thing so that you know essentially emily fisher sandra clinton and i are not the only ones doing this right because that's not sustainable um and then also thinking about the success or lack of success of um, including men as mentors. So we've done everything around same gender mentoring and the results have been overwhelmingly positive, right? Students in our program are seven times more likely to stay in the geosciences than folks who are not in our program because we've been following cohorts of students through time. Um, and we see that that's in large part due to the fact that we're, um, by being part of our program there, the number of role models in their life um, has significantly increased. And so we see that there's a direct correlation between uh, desire to stay in the field and the number of uh, women role models that uh, these uh, scientists who identify as women um, can name in their lives. So uh, no role models, they report like a 22% chance of staying in the sciences, and if they have three or more, it's up to 77%. So it's it's like my favorite graph to draw on a napkin. <laughs> it's like the most amazing results, and we just want to see how much we can propagate that. Erin is part of a team running a blog that aims to create an online community for women in science. She explained more about this blog and its background for us. The blog space is called Feminisci, Feminisicitor. I don't know, it's Latin, so who knows how it's actually pronounced. Uh, but it's, yeah, so with a group of uh, friends from grad school across a variety of science disciplines uh, post-2016 election feeling a bit gloomy about being women and being women in science, we decided that one um, thing we could work on collectively together was building an online community, an online space to support women in science. Um, by sharing our experiences, by interviewing other folks and hearing about their experiences, um, and sort of just using writing to um, sort of work through some of the challenges that we were processing. And so there have been a wide range of types of topics we've written about. Um, I had a, so not recent anymore, April, a post about um, sort of navigating applying to undergraduate sort of primarily undergraduate institution type academic positions and then now some of my um, friends are putting together posts on uh, industry sort of industry jobs and transition from academic institutions to an industry position and sort of how to navigate that or some strategies for nav navigating that space um, we've interviewed a variety of different folks in different disciplines that are outside of our own disciplines, uh, but really the goal is sort of trying to create this community um, for promoting women in science um, and, uh, yeah, just having sort of a broad range of what it means 
what what is the science we're doing? That's great, but also what it means to have this community to support and sort of uplift um, the awesome stuff that people are doing um, who identify as female and scientists. Thank you for listening to this special Making Waves episode on STEM mentoring. We'll share links to helpful resources on the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. If there are other topics you want us to cover, feel free to get in touch with us. You've been listening to the Making Waves podcast. For more info, for more info, for more info, please visit us online at the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. Tune, Tune in next time for another fresh idea in freshwater science.